do you all recognize what that is? Is there anybody who doesn't know? That's the bridge across the Seine River in Paris, right? No, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. And we show it all the time because it's like the logo and of this, what this whole course is about. Uh, aside from the fact the picture was taken by my grandfather. Now, the point of it all is that we we're all bridge builders. And the idea is to communicate across the river the gap between advances, very exciting advances, in basic biological and engineering sciences on one hand, and their application to human health and an understanding of disease on the other. And we are like the two gentlemen on the catwalk uh, discussing and communicating, and that's the whole point of it. So. Many of you may know a great deal about the subject matter of today, malaria. Uh, hopefully, many of you don't, because then you will be learning new and exciting things about one of the world's great challenges in public health. Now, one of the major themes of this, I always do this, is this. You should think of mosquitoes as being flying syringes. Uh, why are they flying syringes? Uh, because of their capacity uh, to transmit diseases, not just to man. Now, previously in this course, uh, there have been discussions of the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito in relationship to Zika, dengue, and some mentions of yellow fever and chikungunya. Uh, but today's attention is directed to Anopheles mosquitoes, which are the vectors of the various uh, types of malaria. Just this very fact that certain biological agents find their home in one type of mosquito rather than another, in and of itself, raises a very exciting biological question of what goes on here. Why is one the host? And then you have something like West Nile virus, which is capable of setting up housekeeping in many. Now, something that you may not know is that in the history of this country, the city of Washington was decided to be the capital because that was sort of in between the North and the South. And it was also a swamp land where nobody wanted to live. And in the construction of Washington, DC, including the White House, malaria was a major, major health problem. I recently read something to the effect that over 50% of the slaves who built the city of Washington became infected uh, with malaria, as did President Lincoln, General Grant, and many, many others. Uh, public health measures, mainly draining the swamps and so forth and so on. I think if we look to the future, it's not too illogical, although at the moment it may seem a bit so, to ask the question at the bottom here is the future. Could it be that we're going backwards? Could it be that at some time, Washington, D.C. and other parts of the United States could be as they were back in colonial days, uh, suffering from endemic malaria? Uh, environmental changes, global warming is changing the distribution of mosquitoes, as we learned last year from Dr. Sleeman, who the head of the geodetic survey, who talked about the distribution of Aedes mosquitoes moving north out of the Caribbean and carrying them with them dengue. And there was a question mark about Zika at that time. Now, the other problem, of course, is that the major forms of malaria, falciparum and vivax, are increasingly resistant to all of the drugs, 
that we use, at least that are uh, most commonly used. And so this uh, is an interesting thing to speculate upon, and maybe our speakers will have some thoughts about it. Does this combination of changing environment, changing distribution of vectors, and the appearance of drug resistance, is that going to influence the distribution of malaria, which now we primarily think of in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, equatorial South America, and so forth. Well, these are just thoughts. So we're very honored today to have two experts in this field. Our first speaker is Dr. Fotini Sinis, who graduated from Dartmouth uh, Medical School. Uh, she did a residency in medicine at Columbia, physicians and surgeons, and then uh, worked at New York University with Victor Nussenzweig, who is one of the great names uh, in malarial research and in uh, attempted development of malarial vaccines. Uh, following that experience, she was on the faculty at NYU and then came to Hopkins in 2012. Uh, in her even earlier career, she was here at NIH as a Howard Hughes uh, medical student working with Tom Willems in the uh, uh, malarial area. So she became infected, if that's the, that's the right word, very early on. Uh, she's a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the School of Public Health at Hopkins and a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology. Now, our second speaker is Peter Compton, who received an MD and PhD degree from Hopkins. This is Hopkins Day. Uh, and then did his internal medicine residency, residency at the Mass General Hospital before taking an infectious disease fellowship here at the NIH in 2004, where he joined the Laboratory of Immunogenetics to study uh, human immune responses to malaria. Uh, he's a tenure tract investigator and chief of the Malarial Infection Biology and Immunity, Immunity Unit at NIAID. In 2016, he was promoted to a senior investigator. Uh, he does extensive work in Africa, in Mali, and where he conducts cohort studies uh, on the cellular and molecular basis of naturally acquired immunity to malaria. So we're looking forward to hearing your talks. And Fotini, would you begin, please? OK. Thank you, Wynne, for the in nice introduction and the uh, invitation. Let's see if this is. OK. This is your title, right? This is your title? I think so. I'm not sure it's the world's number one killer, but this was the title of the, the course today. But so, so, um, okay. Uh, so, but it may not be the number one killer, but it does remain one of the most important infectious diseases in the world. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, currently, there, it's hard to estimate exactly, but there are about 200 million new cases of malaria a year with 500,000 deaths per year. And you can see from this map, which shows you where transmission is currently occurring, that malaria occurs currently uh, in the tropical and subtropical regions of the world. It's an infection caused by plasmodium parasites, one-celled protozoan parasites of the genus plasmodium. And these parasites cycle between uh, they're Anopheles mosquito host and they're human host. And there are five species of plasmodium that uh, cause malaria in humans. Today, we're largely going to be focusing on plasmodium falciparum, which is responsible for 95% of the deaths uh, from malaria in the world. But uh, we may, we'll also touch on plasmodium vivax, 
uh, which is quite prevalent as well and responsible for a significant amount of morbidity and a, a small amount of mortality. Um, I think that to, uh, to sort of understand what Peter, what Dr. Crompton and I are going to talk about today, it's helpful to um, understand, go over the life cycle and get a general understanding of the life cycle. Uh, in the human host, I'm assuming, yeah, this is working. In the human host, uh, the infection can really be divided into two stages. A pre-erythrocytic stage, which is sporozoites and liver stages that they turn into. And this is really responsible for establishing the infection in, in the host, in the mammalian host or human host in this case. And it's clinically silent. There are no symptoms associated with this. And it's because parasite numbers are low. And then the erythrocytic stage, which is responsible for all clinical symptoms of infection. And that's what Dr. Crompton is going to be talking to you about today. So sporozoites are inoculated uh, by infected mosquitoes. They go to the liver. They infect hepatocytes. A sporozoite infecting a hepatocyte will then develop, change form in that hepatocyte, and develop and multiply into thousands of merozoites which then leave the hepatocyte and initiate the blood stage of infection. The blood stage of infection, the merozoites infect the blood cell, grow, and then multiply, and then infect new red blood cells. So these iterative cycles of replication are what give rise to high parasite numbers and therefore clinical disease. And there is a third component to the life cycle of this parasite, and that is in the mosquito. So some of these red cell stages differentiate to gametocytes or sexual stages that are taken up by a mosquito when she takes her blood meal. And in the mosquito, these, these stages undergo sexual reproduction. So the gametocytes turn into gametes, fused to form a zygote, okinete, and eventually you have a cyst, an oocyst, on the outside of the midgut wall in which sporozoites develop and then they go to salivary glands to be injected into the next host. So a few things are important. One, the mosquito host, from the parasite's point of view, the mosquito host is the most important host because it's the host in which sex occurs, right? Number two, this cycle takes optimally, you know, in optimal conditions, it takes 10 to 15 days. So that mosquito must live 10 to 15 days to transmit the disease. That's a long time in a mosquito's life. And not only that, the length of the cycle, this is optimal, the length of the cycle is temperature dependent. So as the temperature decreases when it's cooler, it takes longer, so that mosquito has to live longer. I thought it would also be good uh, for you to see uh, the life cycle in terms of numbers. So here are numbers of parasites uh, at each stage. And um, in the in green, you can see these are the mosquito stages, and then in red, the stages in the human. But what I really want you to appreciate is that when the parasite is transmitted to the mosquito, there's a bottleneck. When the parasite is transmitted to the human, there's a bottleneck. So the transmission stages are real bottlenecks for this parasite. And then the blood stages, billions, which is why they kill you. <laughs> So um, my talk will be divided into three parts. I'm going to sort of do a little primer on malaria epidemiology uh, so, uh, to, uh, so that we can understand sort of the transmission map and actually some of what um, Wynne was talking about, right? The, is malaria going to come back to the United States? Uh, then I will talk about sporozoite transmission dynamics a bit. Uh, that's the stage that is transmitted to the human. And, um, and then I'm going to end with malaria vaccines targeting the transmission stages. And I have a picture of a mouse here because mice also have their very own malaria parasites, and we take advantage of that. The mouse malaria model is a great model, and actually a lot of very important work has been done in it. And so I will show you data from uh, mouse uh, experiments in mice as well. So, so this is really what um, Wynne was referring to. And uh, 
uh, so he was referring to a time when there was malaria in the temperate regions of the world. And what this map shows you is that in the last hundred years, there has been a shrinking of the malaria map, right? So in 1900, we had malaria transmission basically all over the globe, with the exception of the deserts, the really cold regions, the high altitude regions, right? So where there, where there were Anopheles mosquitoes, we had malaria transmission. Uh, and in the last hundred years, we've really shrunk that map. And, and here in the dark red, you can see uh, where we currently have malaria transmission. And I think that to understand that shrinking of the malaria map, it's, uh, it's helpful to understand, uh, have a, a little bit of a mathematical understanding of, of malaria transmission, but we won't go into too much math. But R0 is an important number. It's, it's for infectious diseases, it is the number of new cases arising from an index case. So in the case of flu, you've got somebody with flu, they cough all over everybody. The number of people that get infected from that coughing, and it's really sort of direct, not direct contact, but contact with fomites from an infected person, um, will, it, you know, you can from, from, those, from that event sort of come up with a basic reproductive rate. And, uh, but with a vector-borne um, infection, it's a little more complicated. And we've tried to mathematically sort of model this, and you know, mathematical models try to approach reality, they never really uh, actually <clears throat> do. Uh, do they never, they're never completely accurate because there's always things we don't understand. But um, this, uh, this mathematical model of, of malaria transmission, telling us what the basic reproductive rate of the malaria parasite is, is can really be distilled into three probabilities. And, and Understanding these three probabilities can really help you understand um, the, the malaria transmission and epidemiology. So probability one is the probability that a susceptible mosquito will feed on an infected person. That person is carrying the gametocytes and become infected. Probability two is the probability that that mosquito will live long enough so that, the spor that to have sporozoites in its salivary glands. And probability three is the probability that this mosquito will now feed upon and infect another person. So malaria transmission was largely eliminated from temperate regions because R0, or the force of malaria infection transmission, is much is significantly lower in temperate regions. Why? Because winters decrease mosquito populations because shorter periods of high humidity decrease mosquito longevity. So mosquito longevity is directly a function of humidity. And so if, if you have long periods of high humidity, like around the equator, you can have six months of high humidity, mosquitoes live longer. And the longer the mosquitoes live, the better they are at tra transmitting. Um, lower temperatures that we have in temperate regions increase the time it takes for the parasite to develop in the mosquito. And then this is kind of, uh, and, then, and then this is actually also very important. The vectors, the Anopheles vectors that we have in Africa, Anopheles gambi, Funestis, and Arabiensis are the most efficient vectors in the world. And why are they the most efficient vectors in the world? It's because uh, they like to feed on humans. So mosquitoes, all mosquitoes tend to have some some preferences in terms of who they like to feed on. A lot of mosquitoes only feed on birds or whatever. But the mosquitoes that carry malaria in the United States, and we still have them, uh, feed on any large mammal. So if someone has malaria in the United States and a mosquito feeds on them and that mosquito becomes infected, chances are maybe 25, 30% that that mosquito might bite another human. With these guys, chances are 95% that that mosquito will bite another human. And since these are very species-specific parasites, you have to have the human be you have to have two human bites, right, to transmit the disease. So these things to all together really conspire to make R naught or the basic reproductive rate of malaria um, of malaria 
much higher in the tropics and subtropics of the world. And here is just a graphic illustration of that. So this is basic reproductive rate and prevalence of malaria. And so if we're in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, where the R0 is here, right? And we have an intervention that decreases uh, the number of new cases that arise from uh, an old case, we haven't done much to uh, the prevalence of infection, right? But if we're here, which is where we were in the temperate regions, and we, and we have interventions, we, we can get a lot more bang for our buck. So interventions such as screens in homes, swamp draining activities, insecticides, anti-malarial drugs have a significantly greater impact on transmission in temperate regions. Um, and with our current toolbox, there's only so much we can do. But we can do something. So this is really our current toolbox. Insecticide treated bed nets, preventing mosquitoes from biting people, so decreasing both the probability that a person will become infected and the probability that an infected person will infect a mosquito. Indoor residual spraying. After a female mosquito feeds, she rests on the walls of the house at, to digest her blood meal, becomes coated with the insecticide and dies, and therefore does not live long enough to transmit disease. And active diagnosis and, and, and treatment of cases is actually um, especially important for preventing severe disease, getting it early. So this is our current toolbox. And when we roll it out full steam, which requires a significant amount of resources, but they're being provided uh, at the moment with the President's Malaria Initiative, with the Gates Foundation, et cetera, oopsie. When we roll it out, we can see something like this. Between the year 2000 and 2015, we have decreased malaria deaths in sub-Saharan Africa, you can see, from around 800,000 now to about 500,000. And then this is in green, the, the decrease in malaria deaths in Asia and in the Americas and the Pacific. So we've had some impact, but you know, we can't really get much further with our current toolbox. And actually, Peter's gonna talk to you a little bit about that. So, um, yeah. So what do we need to move forward? We need vaccines and we need effective one-dose drugs that can target multiple life cycle stages of the parasite. Um, and so right now I was gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the transmission stage of uh, the sporozoites and, and sort of illustrating that that is a bottleneck. And then I'll follow that with a discussion on where we are with vaccines sort of attacking these bottlenecks. Because it kind of makes sense if you have a bottleneck that that may be a good place to target uh, the organism. So. So I thought I would sort of illustrate um, the bottleneck a bit. Okay, so the first thing uh, uh, to, to know is sort of what happens when a mosquito bites you, right? And this is a movie actually that I got off the internet and um, it's a great movie. Before somebody put this up, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have anything and this is fantastic. This is not an Anopheles mosquito, unfortunately. Nobody's put one up with an Anopheles yet but this is an 80s uh, mosquito, but it's the same thing, the same general principle. So, and, and I'm not gonna play the whole movie because it's a five minute movie, but somebody took a movie of a mosquito biting them. And there are some really interesting things that, that can be seen. So first is, um, this is the fascicle that covers the whole proboscis and it comes away when she starts to feed to reveal the thin, the razor thin uh, proboscis that is going into the skin, okay? Um, feeding, the other important thing is feeding is a two-part process. She's not taking blood right now. She's looking for blood. And as she looks for blood, she's giving you something. She's giving us a little bit of her saliva. And if she's infected with a virus like, like Zika or dengue, uh, or if she's infected, if she's an Anopheles mosquito and infected with sporozoites, what is in her salivary glands will come out with her saliva. And the <coughs> way you can know that is that you see it's red here in the skin, and it's because this person's having an immediate 
hypersensitivity reaction to the contents of her saliva. So this is a five minute movie and it takes her a full two and a half minutes to find the blood. And then, and then at around two and a half minutes, you start seeing the belly getting, getting red. Okay. Um, then I, I um, so I thought I'd show you a movie of, of, of a mosquito injecting sporozoites and then what happens to those sporozoites after they're injected. So this is a movie made by a former postdoc in my lab, Christine Hopp. And um, I'll just explain what you're gonna see so that you know what you're looking at. Uh, this is with rodent malaria parasites uh, in a mouse. Um, the mouse is anesthetized on a microscope stage. These are autofluorescent hair follicles. And you can sort of see an outline of the proboscis there. And the parasites are fluorescent, so you can watch them. And you see she's spitting right? Boxes is gone now. And these are the parasites. And the, what you should appreciate is that these parasites are very motile. So number one, they're inoculated into the skin. And number two, they're very motile. And predominantly, they are inoculated into the skin because once the mosquito locates blood, she stops spitting and she starts to suck. So these parasites, we sort of hypothesize that the reason they're motile, so motile, they have this really robust gliding motility, is because um, they need to get out of the skin, uh, because that is where they were, are predominantly um, injected. And how do they get out of the skin? Actually, if you've been watching, you may have seen a few disappear along here, because there's a blood vessel here. They contact blood vessels and then enter blood vessels. So here's another movie from Christine. In this case, the mouse, uh, the mouse's um, blood vessels are labeled in pink and the parasites are green. And where the circle is, uh, you can see, eventually you can see these guys sort of disappear. You can tell that they enter the blood vessel because they go out of the field of view r rather quickly because they're carried by the bloodstream. So, so here is a cartoon of these initial stages of um, malaria infection. And uh, I just want to sort of illustrate what we know about this bottleneck in terms of numbers, right? So mosquitoes, mosquitoes tend to be infected with about, I don't know, a few thousand to 10,000 more uh, sporozoites in their salivary glands. But we have measured how many they inoculate. And in general, it's 10 to 100. So the inoculum is low. Then when we watch them uh, by intravital imaging, we and others have found that only about 20% actually enter the blood circulation. So another bottleneck for the parasite. Then uh, uh, what percentage actually get to the liver and beta hepatocyte and successfully develop? These are bottlenecks that currently are technically not possible to measure. So actually, in order to look at the whole bottleneck, um, uh, a former student in my lab who's actually in the audience, <laughs> Maya, did single mosquito feeds using the mouse model, single mosquito feeds, and see how often does an infected mosquito succeed in initiating a blood stage infection in a mouse. And uh, she found that when mosquitoes have less than 10,000 sporozoites in their salivary glands, only about 5% of bites from those mosquitoes result in a malaria infection. And in the field, about 90% of mosquitoes have less than 10,000 sporozoites in their glands. So you can sort of begin to appreciate what a, kind of a bottleneck this is. And although sim the exact same studies have not really, have not been done on the gametocyte side, other kinds of studies have been done with gametocytes, that is transmission to the mosquito. And it's clear from those studies also that we have a significant bottleneck there as well. So I was just gonna end my talk talking about the vaccine uh, strategies for targeting these uh, two transmission stages. Um, so I, I'll say that there are ongoing vaccine efforts to target each um, each uh, life cycle stage of the parasite. Um, and I'm not gonna talk to you about blood stage vaccines, but um, Dr. Crompton will. 
And I will talk to you about pre-erythrocytic stage vaccines, which are targeting sporozoites and liver stage parasites and transmission blocking vaccines. Even though they're both transmission blocking, it's just sort of the way the field has um, evolved. We call the ones that block uh, transmission in the mosquito, we call those transmission blocking. So the pre-erythrocytic stage vaccine effort really started with Ruth Nussenzweig and then her mentor, Harry Most, and a few others uh, demonstrating in birds and mice, actually Ruth primarily worked in mice, um, that if you immunize mice with high doses of irradiated sporozoites, you can confer sterile protection, i.e. protection from an infected, from several infected mosquito bites. An irradiated sporozoite is an attenuated sporozoite. It's alive, it's metabolically active. It actually goes to the liver when it's injected by a mosquito, but it can't replicate because the radiation has done damage to its DNA. These studies were actually extended to humans in clinical trials using the bites of irradiated mosquitoes. And uh, it turns out humans must receive about 1,000 infected and irradiated mosquito bites to have protection. So that's not a vaccine, right? A thousand infected irradiated mosquito bites is not a vaccine, but it's proof of concept that we can make a vaccine probably by just increasing the dose of sporozoites above what people are naturally exposed to. So the natural exposure is to low numbers. I told you 10, you know, less, maybe 100, but not a lot. And so we don't make robust immune responses to sporozoites that can protect us. If we increase that number, uh, maybe we can. So, uh, so, so there are, hold on. There are, are two sort of approaches that are going on right now. One is um, to attenuate the parasite. So uh, to use a whole parasite vaccine that's attenuated either by radiation or genetically, we can sort of alter genes in those parasites so they can't get through the liver. So we can make a whole parasite vaccine, and I will talk about that. Or we can look at what is the basis of immunity when people are immunized with sporozoites or mice are immunized with sporozoites, and we can make a subunit vaccine based on those few proteins, right? So the, the whole parasite vaccine is a great idea because we know that that is what works. That's, that, that, that's the basis, that was our proof of concept, right? But the problem is that sporozoites cannot be grown in vitro. They can only be grown in mosquitoes. So, uh, so making an FDA approvable product um, is complex. But a company, Scenaria, in Maryland has, has taken the challenge on. And, and here is their a picture of their army of dissectors, right? And they take these mosquitoes that have actually been grown and infected sterilely, uh, sterile except for the malaria parasites in them. And these guys are dissecting them sterilely. And then you have to purify the sporozoites away from the salivary gland debris. And then you have to preserve them if you want to use them for a vaccination. And that's done by freezing them in liquid nitrogen. And I, I think that this is laudable. Uh, right now, the, the very process of um, purifying them and freezing them decreases their infectivity. So beyond, and, and, and so they're, they're not as infectious as one would like, and you need that infectivity to, to confer immunogenicity. So here are, but they proceeded to phase two trials actually with them. And in malaria naive adults, Three IV doses of 900,000 sporozoites uh, gave, uh, gave conferred 64% efficacy when challenged at five months. And in malaria endemic areas, uh, they also performed a, a phase two study and five doses of 270,000 sporozoites um, gave rise, conferred 29% efficacy. What I will say, I, I forgot to point out, these are, this is administered intravenously Again, because these parasites are, um, don't, there's two issues. One is they don't appear at very immunogenic when they're inoculated subcutaneously or, or intramuscularly, and we don't have good ways of inoculating intradermally. 
uh, large numbers of sporozoites intradermally. So again, it's a technical hurdle that really needs to be um, overcome. The other pre-erythrocytic stage vaccine effort is to let what's the target of the immune response that protects, right? And studies using the rodent model demonstrated that protection was conferred by antibodies and T cells specific for the major surface protein of the sporozoite. So here's a scanning EM of the sporozoite, and antibodies targeting the major surface protein do this to the sporozoite. So they, they ruffle and crinkle the surface, and these sporozoites can't move. And you guys know that a sporozoite needs to be able to move to be infectious. Is that bell for me, Wynn? No, okay. Uh, so this is the major surface protein um, that, that has conferred, that, that, that is, um, and this is the major surface protein of the sporozoite. Antibodies to the repeat region, the central repetitive region, um, are associated with protection. And there are T cell epitopes in this um, conserved, so this repeat region is, is actually flanked by two conserved regions a type 1 thrombospondin repeat, which is an adhesion domain, and a 5-amino acid sequence here. There are T cell epitopes in this type 1 thrombospondin repeat. And, um, and, and then what I, in terms of how this protein functions, we don't know. We, we know some of how it functions, but I, I just want to point out one thing, uh, and that is that when the parasite is in its migratory phase, migrating through the mosquito and the mammalian host going to the liver, this adhesion domain is masked. And when it gets to the liver, it's clipped here at this, this highly conserved site is required for proteolytic cleavage of the protein. So we actually have now um, described a functional domain of this protein. And the reason for this cleavage is in order to expose this adhesion domain and the reason for that is somehow it facilitates invasion, but we don't exactly know how. So RTSS is made of, is the most ad advanced malaria vaccine candidate. R for repeats of CS, T for this T cell epitopes in the type 1 thrombospondin repeat, and S is this portion of this protein is fused to the hepatitis B surface antigen. And the reason is that hepatitis B surface antigen makes particles, and particles are more immunogenic than soluble protein. So this is RTSS, and it's actually, uh, we phase, it's, it, it, it did well in phase one and phase two clinical trials. So, and in the last few years, it finished phase three clinical trials in seven African countries. And there were, there were, more than 12,000 kids uh, immunized in this clinical trial. It was huge. Uh, and they, used, they, they immunized two groups of children, children 5 to 17 months and infants 6 to 12 weeks. And they immunized infants because infants are the, the ones that uh, receive the, the routine immunizations. And so if this vaccine worked in infants, it would make life a lot easier. And that's, that's why they did it. And what you can see for the children is that after one, one year after their last immunization, there was 50 and 40, 50 percent efficacy in preventing clinical disease and 47 percent efficacy in preventing severe disease. In infants, it was not as efficacious, possibly because of maternal antibody or an immature immune response. So this was, uh, this is somewhat promising, but these kids were followed for four years, and after four years, the efficacy decreased to 28 percent. With a booster, it, it was bumped a little bit. So what's the deal here, right? You can look at it as the glass half empty or the glass half full. The half empty people say, oh, that's a crappy vaccine. Uh, the glass half full people say, it's the best we've done. It's a milestone in malaria. This is the first time that we have made a malaria, that a malaria vaccine candidate has shown efficacy in the field, it's, it's actually impressive. It may not be the malaria vaccine, but it's proof of concept that we can do it. And, you know, we can probably improve on it, and that's what we're gonna try to do. So currently, RTSS is undergoing phase four clinical trials in three African countries to provide more information on its feasibility, efficacy, and safety. Because its rollout would possibly take resources away from bed nets and insect indoor residual spraying, 
you want to sort of be sure um, that it's going to work. Uh, we can improve its efficacy, probably, by adding other sporozoic proteins to the mix. Or, as I told you, there's, this is a functional domain here, this cleavage site. We can probably improve it by adding this to the mix, this region to the mix. And in fact, there's data recently uh, suggesting that that may indeed be the case. So I have a, two more minutes. OK. So now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, other, uh, the other transmission stage and where we are with vaccines for that. And you just have to get your mind around, um, let's see where, uh, so, so, that trans, so that this is a transmission blocking vaccine that we're trying to make, which is going to block transmission to the mosquito. And so if you look, right, after that mosquito takes a blood meal, you have gametes forming, forming a zygote, an okinate. So that, that mosquito takes a blood meal, and with that blood meal, it's taking serum, with antibodies in it. So if you immunize people against maybe some of these proteins on these guys, which we don't normally see, so we don't make antibodies to them, can those antibodies prevent these processes from happening in the mosquito? You get it? And proof of concept that that could happen was done with uh, chicken malaria. Um, or bird malaria, and they use chickens. Uh, Richard Carter did this. Um, and, and what he did was he immunized chickens with irradiated gametes. And after they got antibodies and everything, he waited, et cetera. And then he infected them with blood stage parasites. Blood stage parasites will give rise to the sexual stages that can infect mosquitoes. You plop them on top of a, a mosquito cage, and your assay is how many mosquitoes get infected and how heavily do they get infected. And he found that if he immunized these chickens with 270,000 gametes, he could abolish transmission. So that was proof of concept that it could be done. We're not using whole parasite vaccines as we transition to humans because of safety issues. This is a blood product. And because we're not as good with human parasites as trans at transforming the gametocytes to gametes. But we're taking proteins that are on the surface of these um, gametes, TFS-230 and 4845, and proteins that are on the surface of the zygote and okinate, and making them into subunit vaccines. And where we are is, in, is, is a, we're at phase one clinical trials with that. And initial trials um, were a little, um, they, they had a good safety profile, but they were a little disappointing in that the titers of transmission-blocking antibodies were not great. So they immunized humans, then they took the blood from those humans, you know, they took the serum with the antibodies, mixed it with gametocytes, and did membrane feeds on mosquitoes. And then you assay, how good is that serum at, infecting the, at preventing the mosquitoes from getting infected, right? And they, they weren't great. And as they made better, they, they, as they added more potent adjuvants, adjuvants will increase the antibody response, uh, they started having unacceptable uh, reactions in the immunized people. So now what they're doing is conjugating TFS25 to a carrier protein from Pseudomonas, which actually makes nanoparticles. And it's the same thing that they did with RTSS. Particles are more immunogenic than soluble protein. So these are much better. They have better immunogenicity in humans. They have some transmit. They have transmission blocking activity in a membrane feed assay, and they have a good safety profile. So the next step will be to continue to test formulations and adjuvants to increase antibody titers. Safety is critical, right? Since this is a herd immunity vaccine, and as trials progress, we're going to need to move the top candidates from membrane feeding assays to actually direct human feed assays, and then into the field. So my concluding slide is that the malaria vaccine will never be a smallpox vaccine, right? The smallpox vaccine alone was responsible for the eradication of smallpox from this planet. Not completely eradicated, but you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, but, but the malaria vaccine will be a component of a larger toolbox that includes vector control and chemotherapy. Nonetheless, a vaccine is critical if we're 
going to contemplate shrinking the map and possible elimination effort. And ideally, it will be a vaccine that combines both the transmission stages and the blood stages that you'll hear about next. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bottini. We have time for questions, and please don't hesitate to ask anything that's on your mind. So I was wondering, um, you mentioned that one of the vaccines that's currently being, uh, that's currently in clinical trials had kind of a suboptimal um, rate of preventing disease. But I was just wondering um, if maybe just a proportion of the population is now immune, if that might have a kind of disproportionate effect in reducing the overall um, incidence of the disease, because there may be less opportunities for the mosquitoes to kind of infect more people and if that's kind of taken into account. So I, I you know, I, I completely agree with you that these are the things that people are trying to mathematically model because it means that you sort of understand or not, right? Even if we don't completely eradicate malaria, maybe we can get transmission down to the part, point where it eradicates itself, mm -hmm. right? And the problem with RTSS, which is our most successful candidate, is that is that immunity wanes. I think if we had 50% efficacy, that was sustained, that can be modeled. And I bet it would have a significant impact. But, um, but the problem is like when it wanes down to the levels of 28%, you know, I'm not sure you're gonna, do you have anything to? Any other? Could you um, please uh, say a few words about how malaria is diagnosed and the advantages and disadvantages of the method? And also, I wonder how big that mosquito was in the video that you showed. <laughs> the scale. You wonder how big? Yeah, the scale. It was just a, it's the same size as, uh, as, as the Anopheline mosquitoes, the 80s Egypti. They're just nastier looking, but they're the same size. So it's not that big, right? You know the little, yeah. Um, are you going to, yeah. So the blood stages are coming next. And um, that's really diagnostics. Is Actually, my main question was the diagnosis of malaria. Yeah, yeah. So, so we diagnose the yeah. blood stages. Uh, that's where uh, it would be nice to have a diagnostic where we could see if somebody was carrying gametocytes, but we don't have that yet. So, diag I mean, not as a rapid diagnostic. So, diagnos diagnostics really are targeting the blood stages, which cause the symptoms. And Peter's going to talk about that next. Yeah, um, I have. Two questions. First, um, my question is about the irrigated sporozoic vaccine, and I'm just wondering um, what the how the initial strain of parasite was ah. chosen, especially with respect to the strain variability of parasites in the world. Yeah, and also the complication in uh, FDA approval because how do you check the integrity of the component? Right, if you know you need to be sure for each sporozoite, it's replicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Scenaria has had to show that they have very little batch-to-batch -batch variability, right? Very little. I mean, that's that the FDA is putting them through hoops. I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that. Um, but I don't know the specifics. Uh, so NF54, which was a strain, it was a, a, it was an airport malaria. So isolated in Holland from some, you know, it used to be, now they spray airplanes and but it used to be that some of malaria infected mosquitoes would hitch a ride on an airplane. And then if you lived near an airport, you might get malaria. And so this was a case of airport malaria in Holland. And, and this is a, the strain that was used uh, for the initial trials. Um, what you bring up is actually extremely important, sort of strain to strain variability. Um, for sure, falciparum, a falciparum uh, vaccine won't protect against vivax, et cetera, right? But will a falciparum vaccine protect against all falciparum? Will it protect against all African falciparum? And then do you need a different one for South America? I mean, as we are, um, as we are doing more studies in humans, it's clear that um, strain variability is going to be an important uh, issue. My, my last question was about, I, I just saw a recent article in social media. I haven't had a chance to read a paper. It came out in Nature Medicine about a monoclonal antibody yeah, that's it. targeting CSP, yeah. right? So I was wondering how 
the epitope it targets compares to the RTSS vaccine? Well, so that's exactly what, so actually we're on that paper, but it's a paper from NIH, Bob, from Bob Cedar's group, right? And so it, he found, he took antibodies from people who were immunized with the irradiated sporozoites, he took B cells, sequenced the antibodies that those B cells were making, first from people that he knew made serum, made antibodies that were effective in a lot of functional assays against sporozoites. He made those antibodies, he made antibodies from people's B cells and he tested them. And he, in a variety of sporozoite uh, assays, infection assays, um, and he found that the antibody that worked the best was an antibody that where one arm binds to the repeats and the other arm binds close, to, or, that has this sort of bifunctional ability, binds close to this cleavage site. And then we found using that, using his antibody, that that antibody does prevent proteolytic cleavage of CSP. So I, you know, these are, this is sort of the future, right? And whether you can make them, actually, Peter's going to talk about monoclonal antibodies. So that, that but, but identifying sort of better targets and expanding is definitely the uh, way we want to go. Um, so I'm actually on that paper with you, oh, uh, with fun. Bob. So it's nice to see you in person. Um, I just want to know if you could talk more about using Pseudomonas as a carrier protein. And so are you using it to create a, this protein system for a nanoparticle? Or does it also affect like GMP manufacturing and how delivery um, to the you human? Know, I, so I said we. When I said we, I was really talking about the field. We malariologists, and I didn't realize that I'm talking to a malaria audience. <laughs> I could, it would, because anyway, um, but that's Patrick Duffy's uh, work. Oh, okay. And I actually don't know that much about the pseudomonas. I think that the pseudomonas has been the breakthrough because it makes the it 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 allows PFS uh, 25 to be made into you know form nanoparticles. So it's been a real breakthrough in immunogenicity, which was their problem, um, and. But I, I don't know the technical details. Okay. Sorry. Uh, let me ask you a question. You, you said that the vaccine will never be like the smallpox vaccine. But when you talk about a vaccine like against a virus or a bacterium, it's a kind of one-to-one -one relationship. Whereas it seems to me the plasmodium isn't just an organism. It's like five different <laughs> organisms. Yeah. And as each phase that it goes through, it's got a new suit, and new clothing, and everything yeah. else. So on one hand, it seems to survive when you add drugs, they become resistant. Is there any evidence in the mouse systems <clears throat> in which this clever technique of uh, developing an antibody that the a uh, mosquito is going to take into its gut and thereby inactivate. Is there any evidence in those systems that the mosquito finds an alternative way uh, to bypass that sort of an antibody approach? Uh, I mean, so I don't think that be we've been doing this. It seems to be such an adaptable beast that it can accommodate almost anything. It seems to me that's something you have to consider. So the parasite in the mosquito yeah. to bypass, right? And I don't think, so chime in if you have any ideas. But my sense is that we have not been doing this long enough to select for variants yet. But if we rolled out a PFS25 vaccine in the field, we very well might be starting to see variants. Yeah. Completely agree. We don't know. But this is a black box right now. Right? So when do you decide then to roll something out in the field when there are questions like that that are out there. Well, I, you know, you do phase one and two trials in, in malaria naive people here, right? And if you see uh, protection, I, I think that given the problem that malaria is in certain parts of the world, I think we're almost obligated to, to sort of to try that. So let me ask you one other question. Uh -huh. uh, as a liver fellow, it always amazes me that particularly Vivax, I believe, can get into that intrahepatic phase and sit there for years. Right. I remember so I didn't address patients that. who had nothing in their blood, and suddenly, you know, 
They had this big fever. They came to a hospital in New York. They weren't fresh out of Africa or South America. Maybe they'd been in the South Pacific four years before. So what do we know about this latency that it can sit within this protected vacuole and then something magic happens and suddenly you have acute malaria Right, so I actually forgot to sort of mention that, right, when I showed the life cycle, that with Vivax and Ovale, you can have these dormant liver stages. So it's a cell cycle arrest, and and they these guys will periodically wake up and initiate a new blood stage infection. And the purpose of it is, and and in, in fact, Vivax was more prevalent in temperate regions. You know, I showed you when back when we had Malaria in Europe, it was mostly Vivax. And, and I think this was the parasite strategy, right, to deal with the winter, right? So you could outlast the winter by being dormant in the liver, and then when the spring came, and there is some evidence from these old, uh, from some of the old um, isolates that have been collected that the duration of their dormancy kind of matched, that the duration got longer as, as you went further north. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not. So don't, let me ask you another but, one. That, but I don't think we know, you know, but these are such rare things. In a huge liver, how many cells are in a liver? It's, and only now. Are, <laughs> so what about, how does sickle cell trait and thalassemia protect against malaria? Are you going to talk about that? Are going to talk about it? Well, okay, we can hold on until after. But, it, but it protects against blood stages. And it doesn't protect against infection. It only protects against severe disease. So I think that it, you know, by decreasing the parasite burden some, you're not going to die. And, and, uh, and uh, so, yeah, these, uh, all of these red cell genetic sort of abnormalities of red cells were probably selected for by malaria parasites. And uh, they are not absolute. Um, protection, but they but they protect against severe disease. Okay, well, we thank you probably... very much for being here. We'll have time for more questions afterwards. Erwin, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful lecture series. Um, and thanks to all of you for braving the terrible weather tonight, and also for the great questions. I look forward to more uh, good questions during or after my, my talk. So my friend and colleague, Dr. Fotini Sinis, is a tough act to follow, but I will do my best to pick up on the Plasmodium falciparum life cycle where she left off and focus on the asexual uh, blood stage. And let's see, the pointer is not, yeah, there we go. So um, as you recall, Fotini described the skin and liver stages that initiate human infection as well as the sexual blood stage gametocytes that are transmitted from the human back to the mosquito vector. It's the uh, asexual blood stage parasites that drive the pathogenesis and cause the disease that we know as malaria. Um, So after replicating uh, in the liver uh, for approximately seven days and causing no symptoms, uh, merozoites emerge out of infected hepatocytes and enter um, the bloodstream. Uh, And they, in the bloodstream, they rapidly attach to and invade red blood cells. The red blood cell provides some degree of shelter to the parasite from the host immune system and also provides a source of nutrients as the parasite is replicating asexually. And over the course of 48 hours or so, the red blood cell will remodel Uh, I'm sorry, the parasite will remodel the red blood cell and export uh, many of its proteins to the surface of the red blood cell. Those proteins are sticky, which cause the infected erythrocyte to adhere to vascular endothelium, presumably to help the parasite avoid splenic clearance. But as you can imagine, sequestration of these infected erythrocytes in the blood vessels of vital organs cause organ dysfunction and disease, and this is exacerbated by the systemic inflammatory response that the parasite induces. And on top of this, the parasite is destroying red blood cells and causing uh, anemia. And so these merozoites that rupture out of the erythrocytes 
will rapidly uh, invade new erythrocytes, and this 48-hour cycle will continue until the host immune response controls the infection or the patient is treated or, unfortunately, they succumb uh, to the disease. Um, and depending on uh, many factors, including genetic factors such as sickle cell trait, but primarily depending on the, the degree of prior malaria exposure, the clinical spectrum can range from, from no symptoms at all to a uh, what we call an uncomplicated febrile illness to severe life-threatening syndromes uh, such as cerebral malaria. And this point is illustrated um, epidemiologically by these representative data uh, from an area of intense malaria transmission. And what I mean by that is people in the setting are infected over 100 times per year or more. And in that context, immunity to severe life-threatening malaria is generally acquired by the age of five or so. If children survive this period, they continue to experience repeated bouts of symptomatic malaria every year as they gradually acquire clinical immunity into adolescence and adulthood. And what I mean by clinical immunity is that these immune adults will have parasites in their blood at levels that would make anyone in here sick and they have no symptoms. Okay, so that's what we mean by uh, malaria immunity. It's non-sterilizing. Okay, now based largely on anecdotal evidence, once this immunity is acquired, in the absence of ongoing exposure to the parasite, it's thought to rapidly wane. So if someone grows up in an endemic area, acquires this immunity, moves to the US, they will become susceptible again to disease if they return and become infected. Okay, so just a little bit more on the clinical spectrum of malaria. Severe malaria is a, a complex set of clinical syndromes, but in a nutshell, what it is, is one or more of, of the following uh, clinical manifestations here, which represent uh, organ damage, essentially, uh, in the presence of parasites in the blood and in the absence of any other cause. Okay, so for example, parasitemia with impaired consciousness or multiple convulsions or seizures is what we refer to as cerebral malaria. And in contrast, uncomplicated malaria is symptomatic infection, but without these severe manifestations. So this is a constellation of symptoms that you're all familiar with. It's essentially a flu-like illness, fevers, chills, headaches, muscle aches, fatigue, uh, et cetera, okay? And then there's the special case of pregnancy-associated malaria in which the infected erythrocytes sequester in the placenta, causing maternal anemia or death, um, as well as miscarriage of the fetus or, or perinatal death, or if the infant survives, uh, low birth weight and other complications. So we are fortunate en enough to have uh, someone in the audience who's going to come up to the front um, and who, who gracious, graciously agreed to describe uh, his experience uh, with malaria. So uh, Baba Carr, if you could join us. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Okay, if you want, I think yep. I think the tradition <laughs> is for you to sit right in this seat. Is that is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you could, um, Ababakar, just tell us about your malaria episode. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Well, I wish it's in French because I am a French speaker, but I will do my best for you to understand when I experienced my episode of malaria. First, as a child, I don't remember too much, but uh, I'm from Senegal first, for people who don't know. One of the best and the greatest country in the world, <laughs> which is in West Africa. And I grew up in the city, but still, if you follow what Peter said about acquiring immunity, because I, I grew up in a city means the transmission was not very high. I didn't really have a, a total immunity like the way he described it. But as a child, almost everybody experienced malaria. But when you live in the city, your parents know, and they, if you have fever, you go to the hospital and they treat you. But as an adult, I was working at Pasteur Institute in Senegal, Dakar, which is also in the city. But 
One time I had to go to Jelmo. For people who work on malaria, it's a site that was set up by Pasteur Institute to study malaria. But that, uh, it's a village where malaria is, uh, it's an endemic transmission and very high because most of African countries, the transmission is seasonal, like only during the, trans the rainy season because that's when you have water that's stuck and the larvae can, you know, can breathe. But in that area, it's all endemic because they have a small lake. The transmission was all over the year. I was there for two weeks to study malaria with a colleague. I was taking prophylaxis, anti-malarial drug, which is quinine, for one week. But people who know that drug, it's very bitter. As a child, we used to throw it that's how many kids end up having cerebral malaria because when your parents give you that, you don't want to take it. As an adult, I was working on malaria, but after one week, I thought because of my lack of knowledge about medicine, how drug works, I took it for one week. And the next week, I said, no, I don't want to take this anymore. But when I returned to Dakar, like the capital, I don't remember after how many days, maybe a week, a few days, I was in the lab, month of August, which is very like 18.5 degrees Celsius, but I felt like chill. I was cold. I said something is, is, is going, is not right. And uh, suddenly I felt like my joint, like what Peter said, it was like a flu like, and uh, have headache. I said, no. I went to the, the other building where we have the clinical lab. I asked a nurse to do a, a fingerprint, and I did my own diagnostic. <laughs> and at that time, we have what we call a QBC test, which is called quantified buffy card. It's a small tube where you can put blood, and it has uh, orange acridine, which will stain the DNA of the, of the parasite and the, and the all white cells. But you can really differentiate. It takes just five minutes. You do a sanctification. You go to the microscope and you can see. And when I check, I saw the parasite. <laughs> to confirm, I did a, I did a tick smears and a thin smears, and I, you know, I could tell. And I went to the other building. Fortunately for me, I went to the medical doctor and I told him I have malaria. I just did the diagnostic. <laughs> he gave me an injection and a prescription. And uh, when I get home, I went home. At night, I, it, was, I, it was okay. And after maybe two days, I did another smash too, and I still found, but very few to make sure, but I, I was able to complete the, the treatment. And that was my last time experience it because after, I think after that, three years later, I came back here. I came here and uh, I used to go to Mali the last few years. But every time I go, I'm, I make sure I take my malaron <laughs> because I know what it, <laughs> what it means to... It's hard for people to understand, but it's really, really a bad disease. And just to, uh, to finish, when I was a child, as I said before, we all experienced malaria, and it was normal for a child growing in Africa. But, you know, you've, you have friends sometimes, people who died, and you know it's because of malaria to show how bad it is. But anyway, if you have questions, that's what I recall about having, having that disease. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So just a couple of questions. So I, for the medical students in the audience, don't get the idea that your patient is going to diagnose malaria for you. This is, <laughs> no. not, this is not how it typically happens. No, no. Um, yeah. But just a, a couple of sort of clinical pearls, I guess. So. Um, Babakar, was, was there anything about the symptoms you were feeling? You said fevers, chills, sort of joint aches joint that, ache, yeah. that felt different from, let's say, a, a flu or a viral illness. Was there anything specific that made you no. think this is malaria? No, I don't think so. Because usually that's a big mistake people are making back in, in, in many endemic areas. Because when you have malaria, you never know if it is malaria or flu. Because I think when you have flu, you have joint pain, you have headache, you have fever. The only difference that I know about being in the, in the field is when you have malaria, the, the, the fever is not, uh, it's like what we call, uh, it's temporary. 
it's not you, because flu usually you have you have fever all the time but malaria it's when i think you have a rupture of the when the red blood cell rupture that's where you have fever and that's why it's very bad because many people when they feel sometimes you feel you are okay because you don't have the fever and even when you're taking drug you don't have fever you think you're okay but you are not but i don't think we can make a real difference between having flu and having malaria. That's right. So just yeah. from a clinical standpoint, yeah. the important point is that malaria presents as what we call an undifferentiated febrile illness. Yeah, yeah. So you really can't distinguish the symptoms of malaria from many other causes of, of symptoms like fevers, chills, like yeah. a flu-like illness. Yeah. And so it really requires, especially here in yeah. people who are returning with malaria from endemic areas, uh, w which is quite unusual, it requires what we call a high index of clinical suspicion to say, well, could this be malaria and to take a travel history and has, has the patient been in an endemic area and could this be malaria? Um, so thank you very much. Any, any questions for, um, for Babakar? No? Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in terms of, of the diagnosis, um, so as Ababakar said, the, the gold standard is uh, microscopic examination of a deem-sustained blood smear, okay? And that's shown here. These are the ring forms within the erythrocytes. And the advantage of this is that microscopically, you can distinguish morphologically the different species, falciparum from bivax, from ovale, et cetera. The other advantage is that it allows you to quantify the parasitemia, which is important for monitoring your patient and sort of getting a sense of prognosis. Uh, rapid diagnostic tests detect parasite antigens in the patient's blood, and these have become very important tools in endemic areas, um, which are generally resource-limited settings because they don't require electricity, and they really don't require any uh, special expertise to, to interpret. Um, PCR is the most sensitive test, but is primarily used in the research uh, setting. So I hope that answers your question about diagnosis. Maybe one question. Sure. The rapid diagnostic test is a binary decision, yes or no? Yes. Or? Yep. And there are issues, that there are some very important issues related to the RDTs, as they're called, that I, I won't get into now, but we could talk about after uh, if you're interested. Now, very briefly, treatment of uh, falciparum malaria consists of what we call oral artemisinin-based combination therapies for uncomplicated malaria. So the idea here is that the artemisinin component of the drug rapidly kills the parasite within the first three days. And then the, the partner drug, and there are many with which artemisinin-based compounds can be partnered, have a longer half-life and serve to sort of mop up the remaining parasite. For severe malaria, the treatment is intravenous artesanate, which is another artemisinin-based compound, followed by oral combination therapy once the patient is able to take oral medications. And just a couple of important points about therapy. These artemisinin-based uh, therapies are very effective. They rapidly kill the parasite, but as Erwin uh, mentioned, and as we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, um, the parasite inevitably develops resistance to every drug that we throw at it, okay? The other important point is that even with optimal therapy, the, the mortality rates for severe malaria remain very high, okay? I would say unacceptably high, and we'll get back to that point in a moment as well. But just as a quick interesting aside, uh, artemisinin was discovered by the Chinese scientist uh, Tu Yu Yu uh, in the early 1970s while she was screening um, traditional Chinese herbal uh, treatments uh, for anti-malarial activity. And so she extracted the artemisinin compound from uh, the sweet wormwood plant uh, and this uh, drugs based on artemisinin have, have really saved uh, literally millions of lives and will probably continue to save millions of lives. And for that remarkable achievement, she uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015. Now, as Fotini mentioned, um, there is a huge burden of disease. 
200 million cases, 2 million severe cases, a half a million deaths. The vast majority of those deaths occur among young children in Sub-Saharan Africa. I have a hard time getting my head around numbers like this. So to help you get a better sense of the impact that malaria has uh, at the community level, uh, we're going to uh, zoom in on a village in Sub-Saharan Africa where we have uh, done malaria research for a number of years. Uh, this is the village of Khalifa Bugu, just outside the capital city of Bamako in Mali. This is a village of about 5,000 uh, people. Um, to give you a sense of scale, each of these green blobs is a lovely mango tree. And this trapezoid here, any guesses as to what that might be? Every village has one, a babakar. Soccer field, right? Okay, so what, what does malaria look like for this community? So this histogram shows the number of febrile malaria episodes uh, per day on the y-axis over three years in a cohort of 695 individuals. And this represents uh, over 25,000 visits to our research clinic in this village. And the obvious pattern here is this very intense and sharply demarcated six-month malaria season that corresponds with the rainy season when the mosquitoes are transmitting the parasites. And it's like clockwork. And there are many things that are striking about this, but among the most striking things is that at the peak of each of these seasons, on a single day, up to 3% of the cohort is presenting to the research clinic with a potentially life-threatening febrile malaria episode, which is a crippling disease burden that's difficult for us to imagine, but it's, I think, easy to imagine how this can have uh, a, a hugely detrimental impact on the socioeconomic well-being of this population. And this happens all through uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, encouragingly, as Dr. Sinis mentioned, since the turn of the century, with the scale up of antimalarial drugs and insecticide treated bed nets, there has been a decline in the incidence of malaria and mortality rates uh, in Africa. However, in a very sobering and, um, and worrisome report, uh, released in December by the WHO, it was stated that this overall decline in global malaria burden has unquestionably leveled off. And in some countries and regions, we are beginning to see reversals in the gains achieved. And so, uh, again, this very concerning report underscores uh, the importance of not only more effectively implementing the tools that we have that Fotini mentioned, drugs, bed nets, and insecticides, uh, but also to develop new tools through research uh, to defeat malaria in patients and populations. And so what are the research priorities uh, in blood stage malaria? And of course, I don't have time to uh, really go through all of the research uh, priorities uh, with the time that we have, but I will briefly touch on the first three and then spend the rest of the time uh, discussing advances and challenges in blood stage vaccine research. So as Erwin mentioned in the beginning, a, a perennial problem in malaria is drug resistance. And we simply need to better understand uh, the mechanism of resistance, how to measure it, and how to manage it. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, with the current first line, uh, uh, the artemisinin-based therapy. Uh, and so I refer you to these references if you're interested in, the, in learning more about that problem. But I will just mention briefly um, that what we refer to as partial artemisinin and resistance uh, emerged in the greater Mekong subregion in Southeast Asia. It typically does not lead to frank treatment failure, but it manifests as a delay or, or a slowing of parasite clearance uh, while someone is on treatment. And the resistance is primarily arising from the early ring stage, and it's uh, known to be associated with mutations in this propeller domain of the P. falciparum uh, Kelch uh, 
uh, 13 protein. Uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, artemisinin is always or should always be given in combination with a partner drug. And it's important to note that in the absence of partner drug resistance, at least currently, this partial artemisinin resistance, like I said, does not typically result in treatment failures. But the, the proportion of treatment failures uh, does increase when there is resistance in both the artemisinin and partner drug, and the incidence of these treatment failures is increasing uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, thankfully, uh, this has not yet spread to or independently arisen in Africa, um, but clearly the emergence of uh, resistance global, uh, globally would be a serious uh, public health uh, problem. Uh, because uh, as it is right now, we really don't have an alternative uh, therapy that's as efficacious and as safe. So that is a, uh, a very high priority in blood stage malaria research. Uh, another uh, priority is to develop adjunctive therapies for severe malaria. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that even with optimal treatment, the mortality rates for severe, severe malaria remain uh, quite high. Uh, and we, we just have to do better. And I, I'll get on the soapbox for a moment and say that, you know, relative to the disease burden of severe malaria, the amount uh, of uh, resources, resources, excuse me, resources invested in understanding the pathogenesis of this disease and how to treat it uh, is embarrassingly low. Uh, and we, you know, we simply have to do uh, better as a, uh, funding and as a research community. Now, a third uh, research uh, priority is this problem of the asymptomatic uh, reservoir of infection. So in endemic areas, particularly in high transmission settings, a very high proportion of people will have parasites in their blood, immune people, at low densities that don't cause disease. And they are a source of gametocytes that can be transmitted back to the mosquito and, and then on to other humans. And so until we have a better understanding of the epidemiology and the biology of these low level asymptomatic infections, how to detect them, how to track them, how to treat them, uh, the ultimate goal of eradication will simply remain elusive. And so that is also uh, a priority in blood stage uh, research. So I will um, spend a little bit of time now discussing um, advances and challenges in blood stage vaccine research. And I'll just start by putting this into context uh, with what Fotini described. Uh, so Fotini described uh, pre-erythrocytic vaccines that ideally would block uh, the infection before or during the liver stage which would not only prevent disease, but would prevent onward transmission of the parasite to the mosquito and on to other humans. She also described transmission blocking vaccines that would inhibit uh, the transmission of gametocytes from the, uh, from the human to the mosquito or interfere uh, with the gametes in the mosquito midgut. Now blood stage vaccines ideally would prevent or reduce the severity of disease, and if highly effective in clearing blood stage parasites, could also contribute to the reduction of transmission. And as Fotini mentioned, because we're really dealing at this point with partially effective vaccines that target different parts of, of the life cycle, uh, a combination vaccine would likely uh, improve uh, vaccine efficacy. Uh, we don't have one now, but that's kind of what the, where the field is going. And I think in thinking about vaccines, it's interesting to think about how the human immune system responds to natural infection. So uh, immunity that, that blocks the infection before or during the liver does not appear to happen in nature, despite hundreds and hundreds of inoculations of sporozoites uh, over, over years, okay? And so the evidence for that is here. Um, if we start with an uninfected cohort before the six-month malaria season, 
And every two weeks, we look in their blood by PCR for the appearance of blood stage parasites. You can see that, uh, and this is in Mali, that over the course of the malaria season, nearly everyone becomes infected with blood stage parasites at a rate that is independent of age. So if you're a four-year-old or a 25-year-old, and this is irrespective of symptoms, it's just the appearance of parasites in the blood, and whether you're a child or an adult, your risk of becoming infected is essentially the same, which indicates, again, that sterilizing liver stage immunity is rarely, if ever, acquired through natural infection. And so the vaccines that Fotini was describing are attempting to take this curve from here to there. And that's a challenge, and hopefully we can do it. Now, in contrast, clinical immunity to blood stage malaria is gradually acquired, as, as we talked about. And that's shown here. If we look at time to disease in people who become infected, you see this gradual uh, decrease in the risk of febrile malaria uh, with increasing age and malaria exposure. Now, the most clear-cut mechanism of protection against blood stage parasites and disease was demonstrated many years ago um, in the Gambia in a study uh, in which purified IgG antibodies were transferred from adults who had acquired immunity to children presenting with symptomatic malaria. And then over the course of 10 days, they looked at the number of parasites in the blood and they found that the antibodies alone, without antimalarial treatment, rapidly reduced the number of parasites in the blood, fever resolved, malaria symptoms resolved. So we know that antibodies play a central role against blood stage parasites, but we're still trying to understand what these, an these protective antibodies are targeting on the parasite and how they function to kill the parasite. So what is their specificity uh, and function? And so over the last few decades, blood stage vaccine research has been a largely empiric process that has targeted uh, proteins involved in merozoite uh, invasion into er erythrocytes. And one example uh, is the highly polymorphic uh, AMA1 uh, protein. And this gets at an issue that someone raised uh, after Fotini talks about the challenge of strain-specific uh, protection, okay? And that was really illustrated in the clinical trial, uh, which basically, it, done in African children, which showed that the AMA1 vaccine uh, was no better at protecting from febrile malaria than the control rabies vaccine. But when they did a sub-analysis in the study, they found modest protection against infections, but only infections that matched the vaccine strain. So evidence for strain-specific uh, or allele-specific protection. And if you recall here, there are over 300 unique AMA1 hap haplotypes that have been identified uh, around the world. Now, another issue that may have prevented this vaccine from protecting children was the recent discovery that AMA1 only triggers erythrocyte invasion when it's in complex with the RON2 uh, protein. And consistent with this, uh, compared to AMA1 immunization alone, immunization with the AMA1 RON2 complex conferred superior protection against falciparum in the Aotis um, monkey model. So it'll be interesting to see as this vaccine goes toward clinical trials, uh, if it's able to perform better than its predecessor. Now, arguably the most uh, promising blood stage vaccine candidate uh, currently is the RH5 protein. Uh, compared to the highly polymorphic AMA1 protein, this is a much more conserved protein, and it's essential for uh, erythrocyte invasion through the basogen uh, surface protein on red blood cells. So basogen shown here in blue in complex with the falciparum RH5 protein uh, in yellow. Uh, and in, in Mali, um, individuals who go into a malaria season with RH5 specific antibodies in their blood 
are at lower risk of febrile malaria uh, compared to people who do not have these antibodies. And this was independent of age and other confounding uh, uh, malaria risk factors. And interestingly, when these antibodies from protected individuals are purified um, and tested in an in vitro uh, uh, in red blood cell growth inhibition assay, uh, those antibodies uh, uh, block parasite growth in a dose-dependent fashion. So this vaccine is now, uh, or this protein is now uh, being developed as a vaccine by Simon Draper and colleagues at Oxford. And they found uh, recently that uh, RH5 does protect against uh, heterologous uh, strain calciparum challenge in the uh, monkey model. And more recently, uh, when um, they found that RH5 immunization of humans induces antibodies that, at least in the in vitro assay, uh, are able to inhibit growth not only of uh, the, um, the, the uh, RH5 strain, but other uh, heterologous parasites. Um, so now, the so the, so those slides are really about which wh what is the antigen that we should target? You know, what is the specificity protective antibodies? The other issue that I think we're that malaria vaccine researchers are just maybe more recently starting to consider is how do these antibodies kill the parasite? Uh, what is their function? Uh, and there are many uh, mechanisms by which antibodies could uh, interfere with the life cycle of the parasite. And there is varying degrees of evidence to support these, uh, including neutralization of merozoites to prevent invasion of red blood cells, or complement-dependent killing or opsonic phagocytosis of merozoites or infected red blood cells. But just to give you a sense that this is still a very active area of research, and we're still uh, learning about how these antibodies function. I'll just show a little bit of unpublished data that shows or suggests that natural killer cells might destroy infected red blood cells through antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. And the idea here is really quite simple. Uh, as, as you know, the parasite will export proteins to the surface of the red blood cell. Uh, those antigens are recognized by circulating antibodies, which are in turn recognized by the FC receptor on natural killer cells, triggering their degranulation and the release of cytotoxic granules that might uh, destroy the infected red blood cell. So does this happen? Well, the answer to that question is in this movie, at least in vitro. And so in this experiment, uh, malaria immune plasma from Malian adults is incubated with natural killer cells in green, malaria-infected red blood cells in red, and uninfected red blood cells uh, in blue. And so you can tell me uh, whether um, ADCC is occurring. So I think you can appreciate the NK cells are patrolling. They're making contact with the red blood cells but really only selectively destroying the red ones and leaving the blue ones alone. Uh, the same experiment now uh, with malaria-naive plasma, so plasma from people like you. You have no antibodies to malaria, presumably. What happens when we repeat uh, the experiment with naive plasma? So again, natural killer cells patrolling, making contact with erythrocytes, but leaving both populations alone. And this is uh, a summary of quantitative data from several donors showing a decline in the number of uh, infected red blood cells in the presence of immune plasma, but not US plasma. And in the presence of immune plasma, a reduction in infected, but not uninfected red blood cells which suggests that NK cells may be selectively lysing uh, calciparum-infected red blood cells uh, through uh, ADCC. Uh, and the point of that is just to really show that we're still um, very much in the learning process of how these protective antibodies work. And you can imagine how that information might influence uh, vaccine um, design. 
So another question that um, comes up in malaria vaccine research is whether um, malaria-associated immune modulation decreases malaria vaccine efficacy. Um, and admittedly, there's very little direct evidence for this. And in fact, there are studies going on now to sort of directly test this. But there are a number of observations that suggest that this might be an issue. Uh, so uh, several uh, groups have observed that in association with malaria, there is an expansion of these funny B cells called atypical memory B cells. Again, B cells make antibodies, antibodies critical for malaria. So these, um, these atypical B cells that can comprise up to 40% of circulating B cells in malaria-exposed individuals, they upregulate a number of inhibitory receptors on their surface, including uh, LIL-RB1 and others. And that is associated with a hyporesponsiveness of these B cells to various stimuli. Uh, and so, for example, their proliferative capacity relative to classical or normal B cells is reduced. Uh, they have less efficient signaling through their B cell receptor. And most importantly, they fail to differentiate into antibody secreting cells uh, when stimulated. So you can imagine how this immunological milieu or background in the target population might make it difficult uh, for the vaccine to generate a robust immune response. Now, a more direct uh, example of this was recently published uh, by uh, Saito and colleagues in Japan <clears throat> who found that falciparum uh, may evade host uh, defense directly by triggering inhibitory receptors on immune cells. And so specifically what they found is that the Riffin family of variant surface antigens, which are expressed on the surface of the red blood cell, bind to inhibitory receptors such as LIL-RB1 or LAIR1 on B cells and natural killer cells, essentially not turning them off, but decreasing their ability to respond and function. So you can imagine how these uh, effects might diminish the efficacy of vaccines uh, in the target population. And so part of the conversation now in the malaria research community is can we just circumvent this immunosuppressive effect, in quotes, by passively giving people monoclonal antibodies that we know are effective in killing the parasite. And we touched on this a little bit, and in fact, we would have included um, Bob Cedar's Nature Medicine paper, and I think Antonio Lancevecchia uh, co-published very similar findings. Hedda Wardeman had a similar paper recently for liver stage vaccines where they've isolated monoclonal antibodies that uh, inhibit essentially uh, sporozoid invasion into hepatocytes. And that idea has really gained traction recently because of the technology that now allows us to isolate and screen uh, monoclonal antibodies of interest from humans. And there are several ways of doing this. This is just one example um, developed by Antonio Lancevecchia and colleagues in which memory B cells um, can be collected from the peripheral blood of donors of, that may have an interesting phenotype, protection from infection. Um, those B cells can be immortalized and single cell sorted. And then the secreted antibodies can be screened for specificity and or function of interest. Those B cell clones can then be plucked out, their RNA isolated, um, and that particular monoclonal um, produced. And so as an example, for, there are several examples for liver stage. For blood stage, there was a recent example of how this technology can be applied to discover interesting antibodies. So in this case, uh, the Lancevecchia group, uh, in collaboration with uh, Pete Bull and colleagues in Kalifi, Kenya, they identified a, a layer one protein insertion in antibodies that generates broad reactivity against the Riffin proteins that are expressed on the red blood cell. And the way that they did this was to screen um, individuals whose serum 
showed the ability to cross agglutinate erythrocytes infected with different strains. So this big blob is basically um, infected erythrocytes, different parasites that have been agglutinated by these serum antibodies. They then pulled memory B cells from these individuals, expressed the antibodies, and screened the antibodies for the ability to do this. And lo and behold, those antibodies had this bizarre insertion of a layer one protein that is encoded on a different chromosome into the VDG, VDJ region of the antibody which endowed that antibody with this broad reactivity against blood stage parasites. And this does not appear to be an uncommon, or it appears to not be an uncommon um, event. Um, as, as many as 10% of individuals in malaria endemic areas have these layer one uh, containing antibodies. And we don't yet definitively know the clinical significance of these antibodies, but it makes uh, the point that by interrogating the B cell uh, repertoires of malaria exposed individuals, uh, we can discover antibodies that may have interesting functional uh, capacity or breadth or potency, and you can un sort of imagine how that could be translated into informing vaccine design or used directly as a um, prophylaxis or therapy for malaria. So my last slide, I hope that you all, uh, I hope you all get home safely with the weather, first of all, but I hope that you leave understanding and remembering that malaria is a potentially life-threatening mosquito-transmitted parasitic disease. It persists as a major serious global public health threat. Unfortunately, the recent progress that we've made against malaria uh, seems to have stalled and even reversed in some countries and regions. And so we desperately need new drugs to combat, combat the emergence of drug-resistant parasites. Uh, effective blood stage vaccines uh, could also be a valuable tool, along with the other tools that Fotini described in the fight against malaria. And I think this is a very exciting time um, to be doing immunology in general, infectious disease research and malaria in particular, because of these very exciting advances in human immunology uh, that will likely accelerate the development of antibody-based tools in particular uh, to fight malaria. I will stop there and take any questions. Thanks, Matt. Do we have more questions? We need to ask. Thank you. Very um, educating talk today. I have I have two questions. Sure. So first one is um, you mentioned how some individuals develop this uh, um, resistance, so to speak, to malaria. So. In the light of what we know uh, from immunology, is that due to specific um, function of the immune system, or is it more due to diversity of the parasite that may be in the wild there? Yeah, it's a good question, and I I didn't pay uh, I think enough attention um, to the idea that part of the delay in the acquisition of immunity is the, um, the high likelihood that you need to um, develop antibodies to different variants. And so, for example, the PFEMP1 uh, variant surface antigens that are expressed on the red blood cell surface that mediate this binding to vascular endothelium are highly polymorphic. And there are actually 60 of them, and the, each one is expressed um, one at a time with each um, um, round of the um, blood stage cycle. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, the complexity in acquiring immunity is not only the, and I didn't get into this a lot, but sort of the short-lived nature of the immune response, but also the, the huge diversity to which you have to generate uh, antibodies. So it's really a combination of both. Mm. Is that, does that sort of get at your question or no? Well, I certainly, that it's not as simple as it even now <laughs> appears to be. 
And the second question is, um, well, that um, production of parasites from red blood cells, uh, is it affecting the regional blood flow through capillaries in any way? That's sort of related to my own interest in research. Okay, no, it's a good question. So, yeah, I think one of the cornerstones of the pathogenesis of malaria is the sequestration of infected red blood cells in blood vessels of vital organs. And it leads to, you know, hemostasis and um, infarction, ischemia in the brain, kidneys, lungs potentially. Uh, and so, yes, it's, it's thought to be one of the, really the cornerstones of the disease is that sequestration. Does that, does that answer your question? Would it be? Uh, uh, does it slow down? I, I think, I think the, the simple answer is yes. I mean, if you, if, if you look at path, you know, sort of pathology of, of, of blood vessels of children who have died of cerebral malaria, they're just full of infected erythrocytes, the capillaries. So if you were a uh, uh, postdoc student and you wanted to work on this, <laughs> might it be interesting to study how the spherozoite actually gets into the hepatocyte? The because if yeah. we knew that and you could block that in some pharmacologic way, the whole disease would disappear. Isn't that the Achilles heel of malaria? Phar uh, pharmacologically? Um, anyway, I mean, yeah. do, we don't know how it gets in, do you? Fotini, I'm going to defer to the liver I mean, stage expert. We don't really know how it gets in. Yeah. We know some of the molecules that are important, maybe the heparin molecules that are important. There you go. And, and then the work of Maria Mota's group um, and Olivier Sylvie, CD81, and, and scavenger, some lipid, uh, lipoprotein scavenger receptors are important. But, but uh, the in vitro, per, so the rodent parasites are likely different from the human parasites, and falciparum is likely different from vivax. And as you know, falciparum sporozoids don't behave robustly in vitro for us to really dissect that whole pathway, you know? I mean, I, I, I think that with advances like Sangeeta's advances, we might. And the humanized. And uh, the humanized liver mouse. Mouse. Oh, yeah. How it gets in and if you could control yeah. that. No, it's a great question. And, and I think, I mean, like Platini said, that the tools are becoming available, including a, a humanized liver mouse model that I think will, um, Shed some light on that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the the strategy of isolating uh, antibodies that are unique to malaria immune individuals is very exciting, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering um, how that is applied to vaccine design. So, like antigen design, uh, it, has the NIH developed a library of surface proteins? For plasmodium to, uh, to for, for screening purposes of all these unique monoclonals that are isolated in immune patients, so what determine the target of these antibodies? Because right now it seems. Yeah, I um, I think it's kind of a complicated question, but um, as a, an example of published data, um, well, well, let me say that there are two general approaches. There's sort of the target-based approach where you can sort of say. I know that antibodies to the CSP protein, for example, are important, right? So I'm only going to focus on B cells that make antibodies to CSP, and then we're going to screen their function, uh, for example, looking at their ability to block sporozoite invasion in hepatocytes or using the humanized mouse model. So that's one approach. The other general approach is an agnostic approach where you don't, you have no idea what the antigen target is, but you screen by function, right? So if you have a functional assay that represents um, invasion of hepatocytes or red blood cells, you can screen those antibodies uh, in those functional assays and then determine the antigen that they're binding to. And, and that was 
the, the example that I gave with the layer one antibodies, that was an agnostic approach where they had no idea what the antigen target was of those broadly reactive antibodies initially. So that, that was the phenotype that they started with. And then through immunoprecipitation and other methods, they were able to identify the antigen target. So it, it, it's a great question. It's a complicated question. I think there are many ways to sort of take advantage of this technology that can be target-based or agnostic or functional-based, antigen-based, et cetera. Um, but there are, I will say that, yes, there are um, essentially, uh, there are 5,400 malaria falciparum proteins, all of which I would say more or less all of them have been expressed. Um, and those libraries are um, available. Well, to, answer, to sort of specifically answer your question. Yeah. Um, so I guess as a, a caveat, so the spore of the white migrates to the liver pretty rapidly, like within a few hours. and then Wait, We're supposed to be talking about the blood stage, right? No, no, no I'm thinking that. Joking. And then I'm in the serious. blood stage, so <laughs> red blood cells become infected so quickly that it's hard for these antibody responses to, to happen fast enough to, to stop this progression. So I guess my question is why hasn't anyone tried using um, vaccine approaches for both stages at the same time? Uh, well, I think we're moving in that direction. So combining a, a liver stage and a blood stage vaccine, yeah. I, I think there's a general consensus that because of the partial efficacy of our current liver stage and blood stage vaccines that our best bet to improve efficacy in part is to combine uh, vaccines that target multiple stages. Is, is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes, and so that, that's, that's definitely a, the direction I think that the field is, is moving toward. Yeah. Well, thank you both again for a really very exciting presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.